Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Society of Ohio Archivists annual meeting. Our theme, Archives in an Era of Change. I am Sherry Gowdy, president of SOA, and it's great to be with all of you this morning. Before we get things going, I want to acknowledge that I am speaking to you from Wapakoneta, Ohio, the traditional land of the Shawnee people. As we come together today, I would like to ask that all of us take a moment to honor and acknowledge the indigenous people across our nation who have stewarded the lands here for generations and continue to deal with the painful legacy of colonization, genocide, and forced removal. I'd also like to take a moment to affirm that Black Lives Matter. Over the next few days, we will attend presentations and hear from archivists, librarians, and memory workers about how they have adapted over the last year. COVID-19 has rocked many of us out of the normal as we knew it before last year. And the calls for social and racial justice, as well as attacks on democracy, have changed the way that we see our world and interact within it. The moment we are in right now is a critical point for our profession. It is also a critical moment for our communities. The Society of Ohio Archivists made a statement one year ago condemning police brutality and declaring solidarity with Black Lives Matter and all marginalized and oppressed people. A few months ago, we made another statement condemning the violence against AAPI community and reaffirming our solidarity with all oppressed people. When we made these statements, we also agreed to address racism within our work and our workplaces. We agreed to hold ourselves and one another accountable. We stated we are not neutral spaces. We pledged to combat the legacy of white supremacy in our organizations. We acknowledged that we must listen and learn from those already doing this work and provide platform for them. What we have done in the year since we issued this statement, what institutions across the state have done in that year, despite a pandemic and all of the difficulties went along with that. This is the accountability we must have receipts for. We must take action every day to fight against the supremacy that is baked into our archives and libraries. And we must vow to protect not just the stories, but the people in the communities of which we are a part of. Because in the end, it is the people, not the paper that matters. I welcome over the next few days, learning more about what organizations and institutions across our state have done and plan to do moving forward. I'd like to thank the entire Educational Programming Committee, particularly Rachel Bussert and Bill Madro for your leadership in planning and putting this conference together. To all of SOA, if you enjoy and value these conferences, I hope you'll consider joining EPC and lending your skills to this important committee. If you're interested, please feel free to reach out to me or anyone on council. Also, thanks to OHC for accommodating us in this virtual setting today. And a huge, huge thank you to Dr. Betsy Hedler for all of your hard work making sure this conference can happen. We couldn't do it without you, and I appreciate you so much. With that said, let's get started with session one for the day. Uh, welcome to Who Controls the Vocabulary? Reviewing and Implementing Community-Based LGBTQ Plus Descriptive Terms. I will be moderating this session, and I'll be keeping an eye on the Q&A for questions that you might have and I'm, we'll take those at the end of the session. Our presenters are Lisa Wood, Curator for Vis Visual Resources, Manuscript and Audiovisual Collections Manager at OHC. Lisa has a bachelor's degree in history and public administration from Ohio University and a master's degree in library and information science from Kent State University. She began her career at the Ohio History Connection in 1997. She has held the positions of customer service representative, archives research assistant, and digitization specialist. Since 2001, Lisa has been the audiovisual curator. Lisa has contributed to many exhibits at the Ohio History Center, published in Timeline Magazine, Echoes Magazine, and the Midwest Archives Conference Newsletter. She has made appearances on WOSU series, Columbus Neighborhoods, and the Ohio History themed podcast, Ohio versus the World with Alex Hasty. Lisa also periodically contributes to the Ohio History Connection history blog. 
Karen Robertson is Curator of Manuscripts at the Ohio History Connection. Karen earned their master's degree in public history from The Ohio State University in 2015, beginning their career at the Ohio History Connection later that year. Karen currently works closely with the Gay Ohio History Initiative and related collections at the Ohio History Connection. Their newest full-length publication, Little Ohio, hit bookstore shelves in November 2019. Karen's daily work can be seen in their many contributions to the Ohio History Connection history blog. Welcome, Lisa and Karen. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Sherry. Um, I especially liked uh, your comment about um, the pe it's the people that matters, um, not the paper. And I think that that's something that um, will be important on this session. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, the slides we have prepared for you today. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and you'll hear from me first, um, and then you'll hear from Lisa at um, the second half of our presentation here. Um, so today we are talking about who controls the vocabulary. Um, we've been reviewing and implementing community-based LGBTQ plus descriptive terms into our catalog at the Ohio History Connection. Um, more simply, what exactly are we doing? Um, that's a nice, pretty title, um, but it has a lot of a lot of words in it. What are, what's actually going on at OHC? So essentially, what we are doing is preparing a new list of subject headings that we're going to be able to use with collections about the LGBTQ plus community, um, and we'll get those into archive space, and then we'll begin to use them. Um, so why did we embark on this project? Um, this project kind of came up pretty organically, which I think is interesting and kind of important to talk about. Um, so this really started when a collection of testimony in front of the um, Ohio legislature asking for um, the passage of an Equality Act. And so I was trying to add some subject headings you can see here, and I was trying to get a little more specific than we normally would and add kind of of the LGBTQ acronym that was represented in the collection. And in order to do this, I had to add terms for, you can see here in the, this red square, um, for bisexual people, transgender people, and then just a general LGBT um, heading. And so that made us think, you know, why can't we be that specific? Why don't we have these words available to us? Um, that, that's a bit of, bit of a problem. Um, and then when we were adding the term for bisexual people, we kind of tripped over another issue. Um, we went to Library of Congress to see what heading they had, and they just had bisexuals. Um, and we looked at it and we said, it, that seems like maybe it should have the word people after it. Uh, that doesn't feel super comfortable. We're not sure. Um, even as a bisexual person myself, I was like, I, I'm not sure which way I, I prefer to hear this. Um, and so we said, you know, this is something that we need to talk about. Um, it's also important to mention that at the time we had just moved into A space. Um, and so our brains were kind of ready to tackle this kind of large scale work. Um, so knowing that we had a problem, um, what did we do next? Um, so we kind of just started by looking for people who had done this work before. Stumbled upon was Homosaurus, which has an amazing logo that you can see here. And so Homosaurus is a great tool, um, basically a vocabulary created by LGBTQ archivists for LGBTQ archivists. Um, very accessible, very easy to use. I suggest checking out their website. Um, so we found that and we were like, yes, this is what we need. Um, one of the other things that we've brought in through this project is staff training, um, which we found is something that's just going to have to be consistent now as part of our jobs. Um, but we worked with Equitas Health for that. And if you're, you're in Ohio, which you probably are if you're at this conference, I suggest working with them for training. Um, and then before we got started, we also looked for buy-in from the entire institution for this as, as a priority that we were going to be spending our time on important as we've realized that this is not a one-stop project. This is going to just kind of become part of our jobs to be more inclusive in this way. Um, so the team embarking on this project, we have kind of two teams that work um, at the same time. We have a group of catalogers who are offering their expertise as catalogers who work with our collections and who work with archive space. 
And then we have a team of staff members and one outside person who identify as members of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, and they're offering their expertise as members of the community. Um, a lot of institutions will just use homosaurus, um, but because we're more of kind of a straight institution who is collecting LGBTQ um, history, we thought it was important to review it and use it as a jumping off point. Um, we recognize that a lot of the catalogers who will come through OHC are not part of the community, and we maybe need to look at these words and provide some guidelines before we just throw them into the system and, and go at it. Um, it's also been a good jumping off point because we found some places where there's words that we want that Homosaurus maybe doesn't have, but by having that list to start conversation, we've come up with those terms. Um, and then we've also kind of noted as we've worked through this that this is a trial run for other projects. We want to tackle words um, that are related to other communities as well. So we're kind of going through this to figure out what does the workflow look like. Um, oops. So talking about what does the workflow look like, um, you'll kind of see here, I tried to, you know, create my little clip art chart here of what's going on. But so essentially everything kind of Q plus team. Um, and um, I, I'm kind of back and forth between both teams because I am both a member of the community and a cataloger. Um, so that team will start by basically going through Homosaurus and whatever we get through that day that we've approved, we create a list of approved words. Sometimes there's guidelines that accompany those words um, and we put those in that document as well. And then I will send that over to the team of catalogers who will review that list. And if they have any questions, anything they would like to see um, based on their knowledge of the collections and of cataloging, um, they'll send those questions back to the other team for consideration. And then once both teams feels okay with a the term, um, then it goes to our final list and can go into archive space. Um, and I go back and forth. I sit on both teams and also communicate between them. Uh, so a couple more specifics about what this looks like. Um, so what we've been doing in the LGBTQ plus team, who is the team that looks at these words first, the light model, and individually reviewing the terms before we come together as a group. Um, so we will designate a chunk of Homosaurus and we'll say, this is what we're gonna talk about next. Let's take a week or two and everybody review these on your own. And essentially what everybody will turn into me is a list of words highlighted or red. Green means I like this word, I want this word in the final list, but I don't really feel like we need to talk about it. Yellow means I'm unsure, I think we need discussion. And red means I don't think we need this word, let's leave it out. And so anywhere that we're all agreed on either green or red, I'll either approve the word or leave the word out. And then we don't have to talk about it, we all agreed. Um, if we're all using different colors or if someone's flagged it as yellow, which normally if someone flags it as yellow, they also leave me a note as to why, then I'll put those words into a list and those are the words that we will actually sit and talk about. Um, sometimes we will drop words that we're okay with having, but we know that they're just not relevant to our collecting scope. We're never going to use them. Um, and so I think that's been important that we're not going to like clog up our catalog with what we don't need. Um, we've also talked in the cataloging group about how the guidelines that this that the team is writing will be integrated directly into the records for each subject heading so that um, kind of our final product we will have an actual final word list and guidelines as a document that people can go read if they want. Um, but if your brain works a little differently and you rather just see it in the catalog as you're working, um, it'll be available there as well. Um, so uh, talking about guidelines, I kind of wanted to give some examples of the guidelines that we've been working with. Um, this is These are kind of things that we've added, again, with that understanding that um, at the Ohio History Connection covering the entire state, we're gonna be collecting from communities that often a cataloger maybe is not a part of. Um, and so if the community can offer some guidelines for how to use these terms, that'll be helpful down the road. Um, so the guidelines serve a couple purposes as you'll see over here on the right side of the screen. Um, number one, we help communicate respectful and accurate term usage for people who aren't a part of the community. Um, so an example of that that we've had is that the term cross-dressing should never be used interchangeably with drag. Um, and that was one where the team felt that that distinction is not always obvious maybe to folks outside of the community, but is important and should be made. Um, and so that term will live 
with cross-dressing and with drag, with both of those subject headings, it'll be embedded in there. Um, these guidelines can also just provide decisions for consistency. Um, so we decided that when you're describing the entirety of the community, we want to use LGBTQ. Um, there are other terms that will be in the catalog, such as queer, that can sometimes be used for the entire community. And we said, just use those if they're called out in the collection. Let's consistently use LGBTQ. Um, so that's kind of an important piece as well, just being consistent about those kinds of things. Um, another really important use of these guidelines is to protect the people featured in our collections. So like Sherry said, the, the people matter more than the paper. Um, so one of the guidelines that we've had kind of along those lines um, is that the term closeted should never be applied to the collection of a living individual who is actively closeted or a deceased individual who left explicit instructions that their identity not be revealed. Um, we also have created a list of terms that we've said, you know, only use these if the person has self-identified in that way. Um, identity can be a really personal thing and we're trying to pr protect while still being open um, to, to interpreting more history. We're, we're still trying to protect the folks who appear in our collection. Um, and these guidelines, they, they cannot be used as a replacement for continual um, training. Um, we shouldn't be asking communities to just, you know, explain themselves to us and then we'll, we'll just go from there. That's our guidelines. We'll move on. Um, what we're finding is that training has to just continue to be a part of our job. Um, these guidelines are helpful, but we need, we need to continue with that understanding to be doing this cataloging work. Um, so just as kind of a broader context, I know we're really specifically working with LGBTQ collections, um, but other people are doing this with other kinds of um, vocabularies. And so I kind of wanted to just list a couple of these projects in case maybe your institution is looking at something a little different than what we're doing. Um, so one thing um, that's great to check out is a documentary called Change the Subject, which Lisa will talk a little bit more about in her section. Um, and this is about uh, the quest to change the term for illegal aliens. Um, the other project that I've been following is Archives for Black Lives in Philadelphia has created an anti-racist description uh, resources guide. Um, I'm sure at some point OHC will be looking at that one as well. Um, there's also the Power of Words Handbook by the National Japanese American Citizens League. Terms. Um, specifically around World War II and American incarceration camps, what terminology to use um, to be very clear about specifically what happened. Um, and then also the Historic New Orleans Collection, if you check out their catalog, they've included a statement about harmful language on their front page, which I think is really useful. Um, and so they've, you know, basically said that, you know, there is harmful language that's going to show up in a history museum in an archive um, because there was harmful language in the past and we're not going to change that, but we can warn you and you're going to have to see it. Um, and I think that that's a really good solution for some past harmful language. And we've also talked about with this new subject heading um, project that, you know, we're not going to make harmful terms into subject headings, but if they appear in the collection, we're also not going to hide that. Um, some related issues that have come up, and these are kind of ongoing questions for us, but I thought it was important to mention that, that these are things that we are thinking about. Um, one of the things we've talked about is how do we preserve these changes as a historic document of themselves, the fact that we're changing things like finding aids and catalog records to be more inclusive is kind of important that we're doing that. And so how do we preserve those old finding aids, the new ones, the changes to talk about how language has changed over time and how that affects archives. Um, so, as I said, language does change over time, and we know as we're approving these words, we'll often kind of laugh that, you know, in 10 years, people aren't going to want these words anymore. Um, and so we've had to talk about how often do we review things? Um, is it generationally? Is it, you know, every time we move to a new cataloging system? What, what, is, what is the guideline there? And we're still figuring that out. Um, also, the, like I talked about, training needing to be consistent. But okay, where is the time for that? Um, archivists have a lot to do. Um, so we're kind of figuring out that new workflow. 
Um, another thing that um, the folks on the LGBTQ plus team asked me to talk about here is that not all staff who are members of the community also automatically understand what we do in the archives. And so our team is mostly staff, um, which is helpful because they have an understanding of OHC and our collections and stuff. Um, but if they don't work in collections, we have had to spend some time um, and, and everybody gets it. I mean, we, we live in the world of Google, like they know what a keyword search is. They know, they know what, what searches for things look like. Um, but we have occasionally had to spend some time and I have to always remind myself, um, you know, stop talking in archival lingo, ex explain what's actually going on here. Um, and ultimately the biggest issue comes down to diversifying staff. Um, you know, as a member of the LGBT catalog, these kinds of collections, I don't, you know, always have to go look at all these guidelines for communities that I'm a part of because I just kind of know. Um, and it, it is kind of a unique opportunity that I could be the bridge between these two groups. Um, it was really important for us that the one group only stay community. And I've seen that the conversation in that group has been different because we have done that. And it's given us this kind of added bonus of getting to be in a space with other staff who are part of my community. I don't often get that. Um, and so that's been kind of just a cool bonus for us as staff. Um, but yeah, it is definitely a unique opportunity that we happen to have someone who is also an archivist and part of this community. Um, I know this is a lot, so I did want to talk about how you can kind of tackle these problems in a bit of a smaller way. Um, embarking on this project, I will be honest, we thought that it would be a lot faster than it has been. It grew really, really quickly. Um, and so that's something to be aware of. Um, so if you can't, you know, do the consultation process, at least using a vocabulary from the community or that another organization has consulted on is helpful. You know, Homosaurus is out there um, to be used. Another thing is you can consider starting with just changing one term and that's especially a term that's used a lot in your collections. I mean, even small changes change. Um, and Lisa will talk a little bit about a term that, that she went in and, and changed in our collection. Um, and that went a lot faster than the process of reviewing hundreds of words um, as a committee. <laughs> um, and again, if, if you don't vocabulary, you can also think about how you're describing people um, and your other work and your scope and content note, the biographical information, um, those things count too and people read those too. Um, and as always, just keep learning, keep seeing what other people are doing and how you might be able to bring it into your work. Um, so before I, I pass things off to Lisa, I just did want to kind of hit on the big idea here, which is that communities deserve control, even if they aren't the archivists in the situation. Um, and so I've got kind of a couple examples here really to, to drive that home. At the bottom here, we have a picture from our collections um, of protests in the 90s outside of the Columbus Dispatch um, about AIDS censorship. And I think this really kind of hits home that, you know, the words that we as a society decide to use or not use, or the things that we decide to be able to talk about, um, these have life and death consequences for communities. And so, you know, with um, the, the communities have the most to lose and they should be in control of the issues that impact them. Um, in the top left here, this picture um, comes from a collection at OHC, which I first processed um, quite a while back. And I was really into this collection at the time and I had no idea why, I, would, I just thought it was the coolest thing in the world. Um, and then recently I came out as non-binary and I went back and looked at this collection. I said, oh, of course, this is why you were interested in it. Um, this person here on the left who went by Ned is very clearly a gender non-conforming person in the past. Um, and so kind of what I wanted to explain here is that Ned and I may not be related, um, but she's my ancestor. And I see her as, as kind of, you know, Understanding her collection was like when you're doing your genealogy and you break through a big brick wall and you, you figure it out. Um, and so that's a collection that, you know, now that I have the terms to describe that, hopefully I can create that experience um, for someone else. Um, and kind of in, in, in closing of, of this section, um, on another personal note, and I think the biggest thing 
to think about before you work on a project like this is that it is going to involve emotional labor, especially for the, the people who are from the community that you are describing. Um, this project often leaves me much more exhausted than anything else I do in my work um, because it's connected to who I am as a person. And so if this is a project that you're gonna embark on, especially if you're a member of the community, think about, you know, do I have the space to do that kind of emotional labor right now? And if you don't, that's okay. And um, it's maybe not time um, for the project, um, but hopefully it is, it's definitely worth doing. Um, and with that, I will pass things on to Lisa. Hello, my name is Lisa Wood. I have been on the cataloger side of the equation. So I get lists and I review them and I make comments. And when on the cataloger side, we're a little more informal. Um, we care and share as documents and teams and we meet once or twice a month as needed to, to discuss terms. So I think the cataloging part of it is, I'm, I've got it a little easier, I think, in terms of the workload so far that this has been for me. Once the terms are approved, I think that's when the catalogers are really going to have our have our work to do when um, we have the full list of terms and guidelines from Karen. So one of the big questions that might come up is how necessary is this work to incorporate inclusive language and cataloging? Do people pay attention to the subject headings in your library catalog? Should this be one of your top priorities when it comes to making, you know, to cataloging and making your collections accessible through the catalog? I can't stress enough that you should watch the Change the Subject documentary. Um, I think it, is, it, it gives you a wonderful real world example of, of how this truly, truly matters. And it could give you the ammunition you might need to tell your supervisor or your institution that this needs to be a priority. As Karen said, OHC is, has agreed, the administrators and our, our supervisors agreed that this is a priority for us. So we're fortunate in, in that respect. So, this documentary, it's only 54 minutes long, very well made. I really wondered how exciting a documentary about library subject headings could be. It's, it's gripping, it really is. And the part that really resonated with me is an interview with a librarian at Dartmouth College. Students came across the term illegal aliens in the catalog. They were extremely upset and they complained. And one of the librarians was asked to talk to the students. She went through the explanation that the term illegal aliens was from the Library of Congress subject headings, that that was a standard vocabulary, all libraries use it, and that's just the term that the libraries use. And the students were very upset. The students didn't like it. They, they didn't really care that it was a standardized term. It was an offensive term, and they still wanted it changed. And and the documentary moves on, but it was, I think, I think the librarian had a real learning experience and understanding that, you know, a standardized term that they found in the catalog and clicked and linked to, you know, a book or a collection, actually people paid attention to it and it affected them. <laughs> so yes, this is extremely, extremely important. We can go to the next slide. Another question that might come up, do you really need to consult with community representatives? I can say as a cataloger a resounding yes. They will not think, they do not think necessarily like archives and library catalogers. They will suggest we take out headings, create headings, qualify headings, but that's really the point of this. If we don't catalog, we have the Gay Ohio History initiative collections. And if we don't catalog the Go High collections in a way that will make it easier for the LGBT community to find, kind of why, why are we building that collection? Um, it's really important to catalog these in a way that, you know, represents the community the way they want to be represented and makes it possible for them to find things. Also, there are terms that Homosaurus provides some definitions, but there are terms that Karen's community group can explain to people outside the community, and, and we really do, do need that. 
So Karen gave examples of the guidelines that she and her group are creating and they and their group are creating. And they are extensive. These, these, they can get, they can be short, they can be detailed. And I also mentioned that Homosaurus has definitions that are very, very helpful. So we use the archive space system for our archival cataloging at the Ohio History Connection. And I pulled up a screenshot of a subject record in archive space, and you can see the scope note there. That is where we are going to be adding all of the homosaurus definitions and the extensive guidelines for each term that the LGBTQ community group is creating for us. So we can move to the next slide. Yes. Karen alluded to the need for training. I have train and remind here, but I really think it's more of a shift in our thinking. It is really easy to find a subject heading in the catalog and click and link it to the resource record for whatever you're cataloging and go about your day. Catalogers, especially really experienced catalogers, we may not look at the scope notes in the subject heading record. We may not look at the source of the subject heading every time we are going to have to shift our thinking and pay attention to that when we have the all of the homosaurus. We should be doing it anyway, but especially when we have all of the homosaurus terms in archive space, that will be need to be a shift in our thinking. And we need to pay attention to our sources of information. The community group and our trainer from Equitas, I mean, they've given us two really basic principles. When you are describing people from any community use descriptive terms that they use to describe themselves and understand that there are terms that are not appropriate for people outside of the community to use. I mean, two very basic principles. And I think when we embark on other projects, um, American Indian language and terminology is going to be a major issue for us in the future. Probably maybe one of the next ones we tackle in terms of a vocabulary. Th these these are going to apply. These would apply to pretty much any community group, LGBTQ and others. Can go to the next. Um, so do terms overlap? Yes, yes, they do. There are terms that Homosaurus has that LCSH does not include. There are also terms that that very much overlap. So how do we handle that? I have a few ideas. One is that you could have two headings in the catalog and you know, one heading, you choose the source Library of Congress subject headings and then you create it again. And then for the second heading, you choose the source Homosaurus for that heading. That could have some technical problems. That is one option. Um, number two, you could create a rule at your institution in your cataloging department that you privilege one vocabulary. And that's, let me explain how I'm using the word privilege there. You just, you make a rule that if a heading exists in Library of Congress and it matches exactly in, you know, tone and meaning the term in Homosaurus that you would just use the Library of Congress subject heading and then use the other vocabularies, Homosaurus or another vocabulary as needed. That's another option. The one that I really wish we could do and Archive Space does not have this functionality and I don't know if any catalogs do actually, is that we could choose multiple sources for a subject heading. So if there's a term that matches, like very closely exactly matches in multiple vocabularies, you could choose multiple sources. I have another screenshot there and it gives the, there's a source, a pull down menu for source in the subject heading record, and I'd, I'd love to be able to click Art and Architecture and LCSH or Homosaurus and LCSH. If we go to the next slide, this actually, again, this is how archive space displays, and this may not be how other catalogs would display this information. Archive space on the public side does display the source of subject headings, which is really exciting. So if we had the functionality to include multiple terms that could be seen. And also when homosaurus terms are here and applied to resource records, you will also see on the public side that it apply that a term is from homosaurus. So what we're doing is in addition to 
being more inclusive and thoughtful in our descriptive language, we're also opening up that process and showing more people how the librarians think and work. You can go to the next one. So how does implementing different thesaurus work in cataloging consortiums? Uh, OHC is, is not part of a cataloging consortium for our archival collections. Our archive space catalog is our instance of archive space hosted by Lyricist. And in our own instance of archive space, we, we can do what we want. We can make local terms, we can pull in any thesaurus we want. I uh, understand that in consortiums, it's different. Our library catalog, for example, we use OCLC WorldShare for our library catalog. And our library catalogers, they are fully aware of what we're doing with Homosaurus, very excited about the project, but they can't really use Homosaurus terms in WorldShare at this time. And if you are in a consortial arrangement where you can't necessarily use terms from a thesaurus that the consortium doesn't use or add local terms, I guess my advice at this point is to do what you can. Um, as Karen said, write all your notes fields very carefully in records. You could create a forum among staff who catalog to talk about terms that could be problematic terms that you have or don't have or would like to have, terms that maybe you want to take out of the catalog. And maybe you can push your consortium to allow for more, for more uh, diversity in the sources of subject headings that they use. So we can go on. Is there a way to streamline this process with technology? Well, it's tempting. I remember years ago, there was a change in the physical description term for photographs. It changed from photo print to photographic prints. I'm the audiovisual curator. I catalog all the photographic material. I did not want to change all those records manually. I went to the catalog manager and said, in the you know, mark tag 300 subfield A, I need to change photo print to photographic prints. She said, okay, she wrote an SQL script. I think it was done later that week and it was beautiful. This is more complicated. Um, this is a shift in thinking. This is a shift in how we work. This is not only changing subject headings or, you know, a, you know, two words that could be used interchangeably. Truly incorporating equitable and inclusive language in your descriptive practices is going to require more than creating find and replace scripts. That said, you might be able to do that once in a while, but that's, that's not the type of project we're talking about. I read a blog, one of our librarians, um, who works on the public service side of things found this great blog at talking about the, the craft of archival and library description and how, you know, this is more complicated. So if I'm not saying it well, I definitely take a look at this blog because I think this person says it very, very well, why this is not going to be a find and replace operation. Karen alluded to this, there are lots of places we're going to find harmful description in our catalogs when we start looking. Subject headings are, are one obvious place, but all of our notes fields, biographical and historical, scope and content, titles of record series, sometimes archivists formulate titles. So if you're working with a formulated title, we, we can edit titles that we formulated in the first place. If we're working with a transcribed title, that's trickier because we're supposed to transcribe. If a work has a title, we're supposed to transcribe it as is. So that's a little trickier, but titles are something to look at. Also the digital library metadata. A lot of our collections are in our archival catalog, archive space, and then some something from the collection is scanned and part of Ohio memory. So once we fix update something in archive space, we also have to look at the metadata in Ohio memory to figure out if that also needs to be updated. So going forward. So I was inspired by Karen's fantastic advice to 
you know, start with one thing. Also, there was an article about cultural humility that they sent to all of us to read. And in that, art in that article, the librarian who wrote it talked about changing internment to incarceration in reference to the imprisonment of Japanese Americans during World War II. I feel pretty strongly about changing that term. And so I thought, I will tackle this. I have a very basic process. Search catalog for related materials, identify and update the records, update the, any related digital library metadata, and document the changes. So let's, let's walk through that and see how it actually went. What did I encounter? Well, the first thing I encountered is that we have few materials related to the imprisonment of Japanese Americans during World War II. On the previous screen, there was a photograph of a woman named Mei Takasugi. Mei lived in Alliance, Ohio with her husband who was working there as an engineer, but they were residents of California. So the government tracked them down and forcibly moved them back to an incarceration camp out West in 1942, 43. And this is a photograph one of her neighbors in Alliance, Ohio took of her before she left because she was she didn't know where she was going or what would happen to her. And she wanted to be remembered. And we have the collection, uh, in the collections we have her parasol and, and this beautiful photograph. The next one you'll see on this screen, there was a woman from, a young woman from Ohio who went to one of the prison camps to teach children during the summer of 1943, children who were in prison there with their families. And that's a, we actually have a copy and those are some pictures from her, her scrapbook. So that was it, two records. I was able to, you know, read through the biographical and historical notes and the scope and content notes. And I was able to update all the language. And then I get to the subject headings. Um, the subject heading that Library of Congress has is Japanese Americans evacuation and relocation 1942 to 1945. And that is used for internment of Japanese Americans and relocation of Japanese Americans. I really, whether you say evacuation, relocation, internment, this is all euphemistic language for imprisoning people, many of whom were American citizens. So it was a little, it, it kind of left me a little, feeling a little stuck. This is the term. So I started to think about it should evacuation and location stay or go in our catalog? And I ask, are there alternative terms? One potential alternative is World War 1939 to 1945 concentration camps, California. I'm not 100% happy with concentration camps because the we all think of the concentration camps in Europe when we hear that term. And the concentrate, you know, in the camps in the United States and the camps in Europe, I, I don't know that I want to confuse confuse those two. So I wasn't sure if I was entirely happy with concentration camp. Prison camp, incarceration camp, those, those are the terms I'd really like to use. Um, so what I did for now is I took the evacuation and location subject heading out of the records for those, those two small collections. And I, I, I did leave it in the catalog for now. I will be having further conversation. We have an authorities team uh, made up of staff who catalog. And I will be discussing it, it further with them. And we, we certainly can try to make a recommendation to the Library of Congress to change this. It's, it, it, it seems like a routine thing. I mean, this seems like a routine thing that librarians do recommend changes in subject type to the vocabulary. However, as you'll see when you watch the Change the Subject documentary, that has become a politicized thing. And I don't, I don't know how quickly a recommendation to the Library of Congress to change the subject heading would happen. And I, I, I don't know how it would actually be received. So in conclusion, my one small attempt turned out to be in some ways easy. I was able to update the notes fields and I was able, Mei Takas, Takasugi actually has her photograph. It is digitized in the digital library. 
And it was very easy to talk to the digital project staff and have them you know, make some edits to the metadata for her picture in the digital library. So that part that was fully under my control to do was, was relatively easy. Um, but when you get to the, the actual structure of LCSH vocabulary, it is more complicated. The Power of Words handbook that Karen mentioned, I, I really need to, to check that out. That should be a next step for me to figure out what terms they recommend. Also, the other thing that I, I should do is write up a report. Karen mentioned that we need to document these changes and I, I'm not sure if writing up a short word report in Word um, is the best way to document this stuff long term and probably be better to figure out how to document it in archive space, but I'll probably be writing up a, a short report for the authorities team about this as well. So on that note, I will turn it over for questions. I'm not quite seeing any questions. Um, Sherry, correct me if I'm wrong here. Yeah, I, I'm not seeing any questions right now either. Um, so while you're thinking of questions, folks, um, thank you, Karen and Lisa, so much for a wonderful presentation. Um, I appreciate so much. I have so many stars on my page of things that I was taking notes about. Um, I like to go back um, until I see a question in the chat. Um, Karen, you were speaking about um, protecting the people and identity and never assuming unless a person self-identified ad as a certain way or a certain um, identity, don't just assume that. And I found that really interesting. Um, last year when we were studying a lot about the 100th anniversary of uh, the right to vote for women, I know that there were a lot of articles talking about the um, possibility that a lot of women may have been lesbians or that kind of thing. And I was just curious, you know, how, how do you know that if there isn't any documentation? Like, I know we don't want to make assumptions, but also like to, to make it more welcoming um, to folks that, you know, it, it's a possibility that, you know, they were living that way and just couldn't publicly say anything. So how do we deal with stuff like that? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked that because um, that's that's an issue that's come up um, and one that's that's very important to me because I don't want to limit us on interpreting historic individuals who lived in societies where they couldn't be our community has no ancestors to talk about. That's that's the wrong direction to go. Um, so I suggest folks read um, an article that's out called Queer Possibility by Margaret Middleton. Um, and I'll try to see if I can maybe link that in the chat about how to, to open up that idea that, that people could be queer and to not see it as putting a stain on someone's historic record, but to see it as making an inference the same way we would say that someone who has a lot of baseball cards in their attic might have been a card collector. Um, but I think really where we're trying to protect people is to not infer the identities of living people. Um, a lot of times um, we will get collections, especially in manuscripts, from folks who are, are still alive and, and living their lives. Um, and we don't want to make assumptions about people whose identities are, are still active and, and important to them. Um, but when it comes to historic folks, it is more important sometimes to make inferences carefully. Um, and so one of the things actually that we are actively talking about in the LGBTQ plus group is perhaps creating a process by which catalogers could um, come to us or other staff who identify as members of the community for consultation on um, you know, am I interpreting this correctly? Is this what I'm seeing? Um, because when you look back, it's it's a lot easier to tell or, or to make these inferences when you have the lived experiences to match. Um, so I guess in summary, yeah, we don't, we don't want to limit making inferences, but we want to protect people who are still alive. And that's kind of where we draw the line. I think Thank you. Might... That helps so much. Oh, I'm so sorry, Lisa. Go ahead. It's okay. I think we might also 
Um, as Karen said, there are, you know, when you have physical evidence and you can make a reasonable, I mean, when you have physical evidence that provides a reasonable inference and also challenging some of our ideas about sources of information, there was a particular collection that Karen and I both worked with where in terms of describing the people in the collection as LGBTQ, we were making some inferences. It was not explicitly stated in the collection. However, they had clothes, both, both of these people were deceased, but their close relatives who donated it to us were very, very clear with us that their whole family knew these people were a couple and that you know they weren't 100% out or open because of the time period in which they lived. But in the close circle of their family, everybody knew this. So that was a situation where based on the physical evidence in the collection and the family being very, very forthright and about it, that was a case where we did feel like we could call them, you know, members of the LGBTQ community in a broad sense. We can't get too much more specific, so we're not going to use terms that they wouldn't have applied to themselves, but mm -hmm. it, it felt like a safe, it felt like a relatively straight and safe word inference for us, but I guess the key for me is if there wasn't enough physical evidence and there wasn't, you know, these vocal family members, multiple vocal family members telling us this, I, I probably wouldn't have made that, you know, mm -hmm. inference. Also, if they were still alive, I probably wouldn't have made, you know, that inference. Yeah. Well. See, and that's, I think, somewhere where, like, we talk about, like, diverse staffing. Like, I think, kind of, like, as a queer person looking at that collection, it jumped out to me, like, this is a couple. Um, and I would have made that inference and them being deceased, like I, I probably would have added those terms. Um, I think one of the things like, like Lisa was talking about not adding terms that people didn't use for themselves is kind of another question that we're grappling with um, because you know certain identity terms didn't exist until fairly recently. Um, but we want people to be able to find the folks who are having similar experiences to people who use those terms now. Um, so sometimes I'll still attach those terms, but in like a scope and content note or a biographical note, I'll say, you know, this person didn't have this term. This is as close as we can approximate to what's going on now. Um, and so in the, in the LGBTQ group, we've talked about like, do we create just like a statement that we can copy and paste every time to say like, these people didn't have these words, we're trying our best. This is as close as we can get. We want you to be able to find the information. Thank you. That that makes a lot of sense. Um, are you guys seeing the questions in the chat, or do you want me to field them to you? Um, I can see them. Can you see them, Lisa? Um, yes. Yeah, someone. One thing that I noticed is someone mentioned that in internment camps was a recent addition to LCSH. I don't. Um, I don't really want to use the term internment. It's it's euphemistic. It it makes it sound like they weren't forced to be there and forced to stay. And the reality is the Japanese Americans were forced to, you know, the incarceration camps and they were forced to stay there. And they lost a lot personally in in the process. And so I, internment isn't, it's, it's just euphemistic language for people being imprisoned. And so, no, I, I, I have not actually participated in recommending changes to LCSH terms before. So that will be, part of it is that I, I use the term staff who catalog when I was talking about our staff, because we have few staff who strictly catalog all day. Um, we have maybe one, one cataloger who focuses on print and serial cataloging in WorldShare as his primary responsibilities. Most of the people who are cataloging archival collections at our institution, government records, manuscripts, audiovisuals, we are all doing curatorial work as well. We are all blogging. We are all working on exhibits, meeting donors. So cataloging is one thing on a list of five or six major responsibilities in our job descriptions. So yeah, I, I haven't actually been able to, to participate in, in something like that. And I certainly with this 
work that we need to do in terms of improving language, I, I, I do need to, to get involved in that. Because yeah, that, that is one I feel personally pretty strongly about. I, I, I just think internment doesn't really get, get at what happened. So it looks like we've also got a question here um, that says, um, you mentioned the politicization of changing terms. Did you get any internal pushback on your projects? Um, so we've been pretty lucky and we really haven't. Um, OHC is a pretty good place to be as a queer person. Um, so we, we haven't really had any pushback, mostly excitement. Um, the only thing that we kind of tripped over was the term homosaurus. Um, being a little bit upsetting for some, actually some staff members who are members of the community, um, having to see kind of that term very similar to homosexual, which they felt kind of some, some feelings about. Um, and so in a lot of cases now, we'll just call this the LGBTQ plus cataloging project, which is actually a better term for it because we've moved beyond the homosaurus into some other terms as well. So that's kind of been our, own, our, only, um, our only pushback. I think the biggest issue for us is balancing resources, primarily time. Any logging project is always going to be, you know, just time intensive. And as I mentioned, you know, with having more staff who catalog than staff who are catalogers, it, it is going to be, you know, just balancing priorities. And also, I think the training aspect um, we have not rolled this out to people who catalog beyond the people who are participating in the cataloging group. So there are going to be more staff who are going to find out more about how the subject heading records in our case space work than they, they may realize now. And we're also going to have challenges with archive space updates because Archive Space 3.0 is coming for people who use Archive Space, you may be aware, and they are making changes to authorities and, and how the authority, authorities work in Archive Space. So hopefully, I actually, that leads, gives me a lot of hope because the trend in the field, the trend with Archive Space development is to make these author records for authorities more robust, to put more information in them. That seems to be the trend that, that they're taking with development and that's only going to work in, in our favor in the long run. All right, um, it looks like we've got one more here. Is there a plan in place or one being developed um, to apply this process to digital item metadata? Well, the I, I, I work closely with the digital products department um, they, and they handle uh, the metadata for our digital library, Ohio Memory, which many of you have probably heard of. Uh, at, right now, we are, they know what we're, we're doing and anytime I ever send them a correction or an update or a change for metadata, they, they are happy to to fix it quickly, especially if it's a mistake. <laughs> um, and also if it's if it's a question of updating um, particularly harmful language. Yeah, they're happy to to do that. And that's a having a more formal process than email someone in digital projects to, to change it. We we haven't gotten there. I know the digital projects department is thinking about how to approach this more comprehensively as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we're in pretty continued conversations and they're working on their own kind of inclusive vocabulary projects that I'm sure we will we will benefit from. Awesome. It looks like there's not any more questions and it is right at 10 o'clock. Um, thank you again, Karen and Lisa, so much. I enjoyed that presentation very much, and I appreciate uh, the just the thoughtfulness of all of the ideas that were talked about. And um, with that, uh, I guess we will close. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Oh. Um, thank you very much. If anybody has future questions, feel free feel free to email and um, and ask. So thank you. Thank you very much. Goodbye.